Well, good evening, everyone. As you uh, have heard, we'll be talking about friendship tonight, and I appreciate Michael leading that song because there is truly no friend like Jesus. And we want to start by listening to our Lord Jesus Christ in John 15 from a passage there in John 15, verses 12 through 17. I want to begin reading uh, in that section here, which actually is familiar because Connor read it this morning. I appreciate that as well. And let's notice John 15. Verses 12 through 17, as we talk about the lost treasure of friendship. Jesus says in verse 12, This is my commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you that you love one another. I'm actually going to blank out the screen because I want to tell a story to start, and it's actually a true story. Jesse Brown was the first African-American naval pilot in U.S. history. He grew up poor and under extreme racial prejudice, yet he dreamed to one day fly in service of the very country that mistreated him so terribly. In the Navy, he gave up reaching out his hand to greet people because every time he tried to greet one of the white soldiers, his hand was just kind of left there hanging awkwardly. That is until he met a man named Tom Hudner. And when he came up to Tom, Tom actually was the one who reached out his hand to Jesse. And Jesse just stared there at his hand, stunned, not believing that this white man had reached out his hand. And he explained to Tom why he was so stunned and how everybody else would reject his offers of friendship. And Tom just said, you'll never have that problem with me. Years later, in December 1950, during the Korean War, Jesse's plane was shot down in the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir by a group of uh, Chinese soldiers hiding in the snow. His plane went down on the frozen mountain and the nose of the plane bent almost in half and it was smoking, something having caught on fire. And of course, on the plane, about five feet in front of him was a 230 gallon tank of gasoline waiting to explode, but his knee was pinned against the cockpit. Well, you see back then the Navy policy was if, if your wingman's plane went down, that was it. You couldn't go land your own plane and try to rescue him and then get back in your plane and leave. You just didn't do that. That was against policy because the rule basically was they'd rather have one person die than two because the chances of surviving that was so slim. Well, when Tom looked down from his plane and saw that Jesse was still alive, he did something against every naval protocol in the book. He did something that no one had ever done before and no one has ever done since. Not only did he take his perfectly good aircraft down to rescue Jesse, but he crash landed it on the mountain, destroying his own plane, hurting his back in the process. Yet despite the pain, Tom rushed over to Jesse, trying as hard as he could to free him, but he was still pinned. He did the next best thing he could, and he shoveled snow onto the burning cockpit to try to put out the fire. And then he noticed that Jesse's hands and neck and head were freezing, so he took out an extra cap that he had and he put it on Jesse's head. And he took his own scarf off his own neck and he wrapped it around Jesse's hands. And the two of them just waited there together, hoping for maybe a helicopter rescue, hoping not to be shot by the enemy. Hours passed. It was almost nightfall and Jesse's life was slipping from him when a rescue chopper arrived. The pilot got out, tried to help Tom cut the nose of the plane with an ax to try to get Jesse out, but the metal was too hard, it was too frozen, the ax didn't make a dent at all. Jesse knew 
he was dying, and Tom knew it too, and the pilot said, we have to leave now before it gets too dark. And Tom told him he, he would. And even though it was the hardest thing he ever did, Tom had to leave and Jesse there. But he said that he remembered that Jesse died right as they were taking off. And in his last moments, Jesse asked that he would tell his wife how much he loved her. And Tom, when he got home, he, he was expected to face severe punishment for his stunt on the mountain, but instead he received a Medal of Honor. His captain told him, quote, There has been no finer act of unselfish heroism in military history. And even though Tom felt honored, he felt horrible having to leave his friend there that he could not, no matter what he did, he could not free his friend from that plane, and he wanted to do more. Well, he went home in his hometown threw a parade for Tom, and they raised money. They raised a check for $1,000, which was basically the equivalent of $9,000 today. And they said, look, we want you. You deserve this. We want you to buy a car. We want you to go on vacation. Do something nice for yourself and for your family. And instead, Tom gave all of it to Jesse's wife and daughter. Decades later, Tom found a way to go back to North Korea to try to bring back Jesse's remains. And in 2013, when he was 89 years old, this 89-year-old man gets on a plane from Massachusetts to Beijing and from Beijing to Pyongyang, North Korea. And he sits down in that intimidating boardroom with the Korean soldiers, the heads of their armies. And he, and he says to them, I, I come to ask for your help to search for the crash site of my friend, Jesse Brown. And Kim Jong-un, the supreme leader of North Korea, admired Tom for coming so far after so long out of faithfulness to his friend. And he authorized his army to search for American MIAs, starting with Jesse Brown. And that search continues today. Of course, it's taking a while because of all the politics and all that. If you want to read more about this, Adam Makos wrote a book about it called Devotion, an epic story of heroism, friendship, and sacrifice. And when Adam was asked in an interview how this story impacted him, he said he fears for our modern day society, which is driven largely by selfishness and the promotion of our own brand. He said we're very self-absorbed in our Facebook and Instagram culture, and Hudner's story encouraged him to remember that the true value in life is in looking outside of ourselves and in caring for friends and for our communities. I agree with his assessment, folks, and what I see in that story of Tom and Jesse is the lost treasure of friendship. And I say it's lost because I fear we just don't value friendship the same way that they used to. And I'll admit that's probably for several reasons. It's partly because we're not united against a common enemy like they were during wartime. And now that we're at peace, we've made each other our enemies. <laughs> now we're competing against each other. It's hard to be friends with the Joneses when you're trying to outdo them. And so in this rat race of success, there no longer is this kind of camaraderie and common bond against a common enemy. But secondly, the concept of friendship has become convoluted with our advances in technology. We've come to believe the definition of a friend is somebody who adds us on Facebook or somebody who sends us pictures once in a while on Snapchat. And I want us to study John 15 and listen to how Jesus describes friendship. And I hope in doing so, we'll learn from Jesus and his friendship with us and his friendship with his closest disciples. And we'll refer back to this story about Tom and Jesse. And we'll talk some about David and Jonathan. And in the process, I hope we can excavate and uncover the lost treasure of friendship in our lives. And in this text in John 15, we see five keys to uncovering the lost treasure of friendship. First of all, we see love. There in, in the, the text, did you notice that it actually starts and ends with the same thing in verses 12 and verse 17 with this command to love one another. Love is the foundation of friendship. Love adds depth and substance to friendship. And sometimes we lose the treasure of friendship in our lives because we're too superficial in our standards for making friends. Perhaps we're just looking for people that we like. 
And so maybe we spend time with them and, you know, they just don't, they don't like a lot of the same things that we, that we like. And maybe their personality is just a little odd or a little different. We just determine, well, we just can't be friends with this person. And we kind of write them off. Well, did you know that research bears out we have to have multiple encounters with people before we can tell whether we'll be good friends or not? So instead of just maybe having one conversation with somebody and saying, well, they're just weird or they're different, I just, this isn't going to work, love actually helps us pursue that person further. Love says, I want to get to know you, not just for your commonalities with me, not just because our personalities are exactly the same, but because I care about you as a human being made in the image of God. Think about Jesus. He tells us here, love one another just as I have loved you. Here's a question. Did Jesus befriend us because we were so much like him? <laughs> Did Jesus befriend us because we were holy and just and sinless and zealous for God the way he was? Mm -hmm. Of course not. Jesus befriended us even when we were his enemies. Because real friendship is founded on love, not just like. You think about Tom reaching out his hand to Jesse. Did he do that because, well, they just had so much in common? Well, no. In fact, you look deeper into the story, they came from two completely different worlds. Tom was from a very rich family in New England, and he was in line to inherit a fortune from his family. Jesse was from Mississippi, working barefoot out in the fields by day, only to return home to a leaky shack at night. And plus, Tom was white and Jesse was black at a time when that mattered to people. But you know, it didn't matter to Tom. It didn't matter to Jesse because of love. Look in 1 Samuel 18. In 1 Samuel 18, at the relationship between Jonathan and David. And in 1 Samuel 18, look in verse 1. I love how the text reads here. <laughs> It says, when it came about, when he had finished speaking to Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. David and Jonathan should not have been friends. They came from two different worlds. Jonathan was a prince. David was a, a shepherd. And, of course, once Jonathan caught wind that the Lord had anointed David and that David was supposed to be king, well... That friendship should have ended. Jonathan should have said, look, I need to get rid of David. That way I can be king. But he didn't because of love. Love reigned in that friendship and conquered the superficial differences between them. And maybe sometimes the significant differences between them. Look in Proverbs 17, 17. Proverbs 17, 17. <clears throat> It says, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. A friend loves at all times. You know, this opens up a door for making more friends because it shows us how to make friends. Proactive love is what makes friends. Sometimes we lose out on the treasure of friendship because we're keeping our love to ourselves and not sharing it with others. Maybe we're waiting for friends to come to us. <laughs> to add us on Facebook or to call us and to see how we're doing. But that's just not how, how making friends works. We've got to get out and be proactive. That's how it was with Jesus. Jesus didn't wait for us to make friends with him. <laughs> I'm grateful for that. He came down to earth and, and made friends for us and showed us the greatest act of love known to man. Tom reached out his hand first to Jesse, not the other way around. But herein lies the problem. It's hard sometimes to be proactive in our search for friendship because then we open ourselves up to the risk of rejection and hurt. And that's where we come to the second key to uncovering the treasure of friendship. And that is a life laid down. Jesus says back in our text in John 15, verse 13, greater love is no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. What we learn from this text is that real love for friends takes sacrifice. Now, certainly, Jesus' sacrifice was the greatest ever made. He literally laid down his life for us on the cross. And Tom Hunter laid down his life for his friend Jesse by crashing his plane into a mountain and then being willing to freeze to death or be shot by the enemy just to stay with his friend in the hopes of being rescued. 
And I recognize we probably won't have to be crucified for our friends. We probably won't have to fly a plane into a mountain <laughs> to show our love. But real friendship takes sacrifice. Turn back to uh, 1 Samuel 18 again. This is one of those verses where it's like somebody added it in my Bible. I've read this so many times and I've never seen this verse. Or I've seen it and it didn't register and I just didn't know what I was reading. Just think about the power here. Right after that, that verse we just read in 1 Samuel 18 verse 1 about Jonathan loving David as himself. Listen to how the text continues in verse 2. Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, including his sword and his bow and his belt. Jonathan the prince was willing to strip himself of everything and give it to David. He stripped himself of his royal robe and all his armor and his weapons. He laid down essentially his, his status as heir to the king and handed over that kingship to David instead. This sounds a little bit like Philippians 2, doesn't it? Jesus stripping himself for us on the cross, emptying himself of his royal status so that we could be elevated to a position of royalty as well. Friendship takes great sacrifice. And we may have to sacrifice getting our way. We may have to sacrifice our time and our energy driving to a friend's house when they need us. We may have to sacrifice our own opinions or thoughts and just listen. We may have to sacrifice our own security by making ourselves vulnerable in conversation. And of course, if our friends hurt us and they disappoint us, that's painful and it's unpleasant. We may have to sacrifice our pride and forgive them even when it's, when it's really hard. And sometimes we lose the treasure of friendship in our lives because we don't want to strip ourselves and make those kinds of sacrifices because it's much easier, isn't it? <laughs> it's much easier to just isolate when we create an island, you know, there's no, there's no one around to hurt us. When we make friends with people on a TV show or in books we read, it's much less risky because they can't, they can't do us any harm. But Jesus says real love is willing to endure hurt and pain for the benefit of our friends. And the truth is, we'll never experience the true treasure of friendship without making ourselves vulnerable to the risks of being disappointed, being hurt, or in extreme cases, killed for the people that we love. And if we're thinking, I just don't know if there's anybody that I'd be willing to lay down my life for, well, maybe we need to give ourselves some more credit. Maybe we're just, that's just kind of a scary, overwhelming thought, and we think, oh, there's no way I could do that. Maybe we could. You'd be surprised what you would do for a true friend. But if it is the case that really, oh, there's just nobody in my life that I would, I would ever think to lay down my life for, well... That may be a sign. It may be a sign that we're losing out on the treasure of the friendship that Jesus came to model for us. And we may need to proactively go love more and find more friends that we can sacrifice and lay down our lives for. That may sound costly, I know. But in the end, it's far more costly to not experience the treasure of friendship. Thirdly, we need loyalty. We need loyalty. Look back in, in John 15. I have to go around this verse here for a second just to explain how I'm using it because it's a little <laughs> complicated in terms of our modern day application. But in John 15 verse 14, Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. This verse isn't so much about Jesus's friendship to us as much as our friendship to him. He's telling us a requirement of staying friends with him is to obey him and do his will. And the reason that's hard to apply to our our friendships today, yes, this applies to our friendship with Jesus because he's the Lord, right? But if we go and tell our friends, listen, you can only be my friend if you do everything I tell you. <laughs> We're probably not going to have any friends at all. But Jesus can say this because he's the Lord and, and we're not, all right? But at the heart of this verse is a principle that does apply to our friendships, and that is loyalty. Jesus is looking for people who are loyal to him, who stick with him, who don't just do what he says and what he commands when it's convenient for them and then goes away when things get, get hard. 
Think about Jesus' loyalty on the other end to us. I really love uh, John 13, 1. Look, look what the text says there. In John 13, 1, Before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world of the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus loved us to the very end of his life here on this earth. He didn't just love us up to the point of the end, up to the point of the crucifixion, and then say, well, forget it, it's not worth it. No, he loved us and he stuck with us all the way until his final dying breath. And of course, we know his loyalty didn't just end at his death, as we talked about Wednesday night in the Great Commission. Remember, he told the disciples, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Look in John 6, because there we see a snapshot of loyalty from Jesus' closest disciples. Jesus was here feeding the 5,000. Of course, after that happened, they really just wanted more bread. <laughs> and Jesus starts talking about the real bread and the real drink that they need, and that's belief in Him, in a relationship with Him. And He says some things that are kind of difficult, sound kind of strange to the people around Him, and they leave. And look what happens here in John 6, verse 66. As a result of this, many of His disciples withdrew and were not walking with Him anymore. And so Jesus said to the twelve, You do not want to go away also, do you? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. This is the loyalty of a friend. A true friend stays with us when everyone else has left. In Proverbs 18, verse 24. Look in Proverbs 18, verse 24. There are a lot of great things about Facebook, and I am not condemning anyone for using it. I, of course, I use Facebook. But this verse, I think, is a great warning about Facebook. In uh, Proverbs 18, verse 24, a man of too many friends comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. We might think life is good when we have a thousand friends on Facebook. <laughs> but God says, actually, that can be ruinous. That can be to our detriment. And that's because if we have a thousand friends, if we have 200, 300, 400, 500, 1,000, 2,000 friends on social media, not all of them really are true friends. You see, with friendship, we're not looking for thousands of shallow relationships. We're looking for a few deep loyal relationships. We're not looking for friends we can count. We're looking for friends we can count on. If we're going to experience the treasure of friendship in our lives, we'll need to be people who stick with our friends even in the hard times. Even when it seems they have nothing to offer us because they are in their darkest, most vulnerable moments even when they look at us and they say, I don't know why you care about me. I'm a mess. I don't know why you're sticking around. We say to them, to whom shall I go? You are my friend. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to sit with you on this frozen mountain while the enemy is firing at us. I'm going to sit with you in this hospital bed. I'm going to remember the promises I've made you. I'm going to make good on them. I'm going to sacrifice my own plane in my own life because I want to be a friend that sticks even closer to you than a brother does. We see this loyalty displayed again with Jonathan. Look in 1 Samuel 20. It's one thing for Jonathan if he just kind of secretly befriended David on the side and hid it from his father Saul, but he made his friendship known by defending David before the king by staying loyal to David, even when it was a personal risk to him. And we see this very personal risk to him. In 1 Samuel 20, David doesn't show up to dinner. Jonathan defends him. Listen to what happens. Saul's anger burned, verse 30, against Jonathan. And he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you are choosing the son of Jesse? to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness. For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Therefore now send and bring him to me, for he must surely die. But Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and said to him, Why should he be put to death? What has he done? And then Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him down. So Jonathan knew that his father had decided to put David to death. 
Sometimes we lose the treasure of friendship in our lives because we're more interested in what people can do for us than what we can do for them. It's easy to be great friends when times are good and they're, our friends are happy and they're making us happy and they're making us laugh. But when hard times come and our friends really need us, that's when our friendship is tested. When someone's throwing a spear at us to test our loyalty to our friends is when it's really tested. Will we stick around and stand by our friend's side the way Jesus stands by our side? Or will we run away? If we run away when things get tough, the treasure of friendship will forever remain lost to us. And fourthly, we see in our text in John 15 that the key to unlocking the true treasure of friendship is by letting people in. Verse 15, Jesus talks about this master-slave relationship. If you think about it, in a slave-master relationship, the master doesn't have to tell his slave a thing. The master doesn't have to tell his slave about his plans, about where he's going, about his dreams, his goals, his feelings. In fact, it would be kind of, back in that culture, it would be kind of silly for the master to disclose those things to, to a slave. But between friends, you see, there is intimate disclosure. And this is what Jesus says no longer do I call you slaves, for the slave doesn't know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends because, or for, all things that I've heard from my father I have made known to you. Jesus says now that we're friends, he has made known to us all of God's plans and goals and purposes for us. He's not kept them a secret as if he needs to be guarded and, and not let us in to this information. I like how John puts it in John 14, verse 21. John 14, verse 21, Jesus says here, He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my, by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Sometimes we lose the treasure of friendship in our lives because we won't let anyone in. We won't disclose ourselves to anyone. This is that vulnerable part of friendship that's kind of scary because, you know, if, if people know what we're thinking, well, they may think we're dumb. And so maybe it's just safer to keep our thoughts to ourselves. Or if we tell people what we're feeling, well, maybe they'll think we're just being over dramatic or high maintenance or for men, you know, a little too in touch with our feminine side. <laughs> if we tell people our dreams, they may make fun of us for it and tell us it's impossible. So rather than opening up and, and disclosing ourselves to people, our true and deepest selves, we keep all our conversations superficial. And when things get too serious, maybe we laugh it off or we change the subject to something less personal. And when we do that, it may feel safe, but we're losing out on the real treasure of friendship. And here's the, here's the amazing thing. Even Jesus needed friends. Think about that. Even Jesus needed friends while he was on the earth. Look back in Mark chapter 3 and verse 14 when he appoints the 12. This is what he says will be the, will be the purpose. <coughs> In Mark 3, I think I said verse 12, Mark 3, verse 14, rather, Mark 3, verse 14, says, and, and he appointed the 12 so that they would be with him and that he could send them out to preach. You notice the first part of that verse? Jesus did not just appoint the 12 so he could use them for their preaching services. He appointed them, why? So that they could be with him. Jesus was looking for people to be with him while he was on the earth. In the beginning, God said in Genesis 2 and verse 18, it is not good that man should be alone. We are just not meant to be alone in this life. And of course, the immediate context in Genesis 2 is about marriage, but that applies to all relationships. We need friends. And I'm amazed at how people in our culture and sometimes, sometimes even in the church that don't think that they need friends. They, that they can just come to church and do the whole worship thing and tell everybody I'm fine and then go home and all alone all week and then come back and do the worship thing and then tell everybody I'm fine and then go home and be alone all week. And that's just not, it's just not good. Because if Jesus, the Son of God, needed friends in his life, why do we think that we're fine without them? 
I understand we have differing levels of friends. We'll talk about that more in a second. There are some people we just enjoy palling around with, and you know we don't really talk about anything deep, and they're just fun to be around. I, I get that. But if all of our relationships are like that, and we don't have we don't have anybody where we talk about the deep, serious things and disclose ourselves to them, well, we're going to lose out on the treasure of friendship. That's the treasure that Jesus had with his disciples and the treasure that Tom had with Jesse and that David had with Jonathan and the treasure that we can all have if we'll be willing to sacrifice the walls that we put up and allow people in. And maybe a good question is, why do we need friends at all? Why would Jesus need friends? Why do we need friends? What's the point? Why does God even bless us with this thing called friendship? It's because friends strengthen us on the way to heaven. Having friends means that we don't have to walk this Christian path alone, and not being alone is so important. In fact, what is the worst punishment in our public prison system other than death? (laughs) Solitary confinement. Solitary confinement. It's because we need connection with other people. Being alone is so discouraging and disheartening and painful. And it makes everything in life harder, really. And we don't need to make our Christianity harder (laughs) than it already is by trying to do it alone. Friends strengthen us because they help make the joyful times even more joyful. Have you ever had something great happen to you? And you just had to share it with somebody. You just had to call somebody and tell them about this great news. And then when, and then when they smiled and you saw that they lit up at the great news, you, you felt even more joy over it. That strengthens us in this world full of sin and darkness. Friends also make, make the hard times more bearable. Someone once said, I'd rather walk with a friend in the dark than walk alone in the light. You said that? That was Helen Keller. A lot more powerful coming from her. I'd rather walk with a friend in the dark than alone in the light. I'm convinced one of the reasons Paul the Apostle, I know I'm changing gears, throwing another person in the mix here, but think about Paul the Apostle. How is he so strong and joyful, and how could he endure so much through so much suffering? I'm convinced it's because of those little sections at the end of his letters where what does he do? He lists all the friends that he has, that support system, all those companions that traveled with him. I think Paul's tune would have been a lot different if he didn't have anybody to put in any of those lists at the end of his letters. And finally, of course, friends strengthen us by helping us know ourselves better. They show us who we really are. They accept us for who we are, but they also show us where we need to change. Um, Friends can see our flaws much quicker than we can. And so that can be a good mirror so that we, when we say or do something and they react, it can expose where we're really at and our strengths and weaknesses. And because friends are supposed to strengthen us on the way to heaven, that leads me to the final point about how to experience the lost treasure of friendship, and that is letting people go. Letting people go. Look back in our text in verses 16 and 17. Jesus says, You did not choose me, But I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. And this I command you that you love one another. Jesus chose who to call friends and he let the rest go. In order to experience the true treasure of friendship, we're going to have to do the same for two reasons. One, we can't be friends with everyone. We can certainly be friendly to everyone, and we can demonstrate love to everyone, but we can't have that close, intimate friendship with everyone. Even Jesus could not be close friends with everyone on the earth. He certainly could be friendly with everyone, but he did not disclose the deepest secrets of his feelings and his heart to every person that he came across. He did not make himself vulnerable to everyone. He did not invite everyone into the Garden of Gethsemane. He chose his friends, and he let everyone else go. Now, certainly, now that he's up in heaven, and he doesn't have any of the earthly constraints like time and and limited human resources, Jesus actually can be intimate friends with everyone who's willing to be friends with him. But while he was on the earth, that didn't work that way. Even among his followers, there were differing levels of friendships within those groups. You think about the 5,000 
Certainly he was friends with them and he showed them love and, and fed them. But was his relationship with the 5,000 the same as his relationship with the 70 that he sent out in Luke's account? No, it was not. And even though he sent these 70 disciples out in Luke's account, he still had 12 that he considered even closer than the 70. And here's a question. Was the relationship of the 12 the same as the relationship of the 3? <laughs> even within the 12, he had a closer network of friends in the 3. And possibly, I don't want to read too much into this. I'm not sure about this. But possibly, even amongst the 3, there was the one, John, who called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. And I say that because I... I don't know for a fact if that means, oh, he, he was actually closer than all the others, or if that's just how he identified himself in, in his gospel. I don't know. But that makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> that's how it works in our lives. Okay? Though the 70 were followers of Jesus, he just didn't have the same relationship with the 70 that he had with the three. And this is important because I don't want us to get the impression from this lesson that if you want to be a good Christian... And the only way to be a good Christian is to go out and you just have to be intimate, close friends with every person that you meet. And you have to share your deepest intimate secrets with every person and, and have this great... That's just not realistic. That doesn't work because we, we don't have those kinds of resources. I think that's another reason we won't turn there because we already looked at it. But Proverbs 18.24, a man of too many friends comes to ruin. Part of that's because not all of them are really friends and out for our, our good. But part of it is just because... It's exhausting. You can't have too many friends. <laughs> Otherwise, you're investing too much of your time and, and energy and, and money and, and sacrifice and all that into too many people, and you just don't have that much, that much to give. Rather than strengthening us, that ends up draining us. That means just like Jesus, we'll have these concentric circles of friendship. We'll have the 5,000 in our lives. Right? The 5,000, uh, those are people like at work you know, that you run into in the hall and you know them by name or at school, and you know the people by name, and you see them around, those are your 5,000. But then we'll have the 70. The 70, let's just say that's the church, all right? Those are the people that you share a relationship with in Jesus Christ, and naturally, your relationship with the 70 is going to be much closer than your relationship to the 5,000. But you know what? Even within the church, even within the local congregation here, our 70, okay, they're going to be 12 that you'll be even closer to than, than all the 70. That's not a slight against anybody else in the membership. That's just the way life works. And even amongst the 12, you're going to have three. And even amongst the three, you're going to have one. And that's how the true treasure of friendship thrives. And that may mean practically, rather than trying to disclose I know it's tempting, that status update. It's just so inviting. But rather than trying to disclose our deepest selves to our 300 friends on social media, it's actually better to just pick up the phone and disclose ourselves to one. That's actually more satisfying. You can put the status update. That's fine. Do that if you want. But what's most satisfying is when you have that close relationship with one or, or a few that's truly deep and meaningful, rather than trying to get our fulfillment based on, well, how many people liked what I said? How many people click like on, on my comment or, or put a heart up there or whatever? And we also, of course, have to choose our friends because we don't want to be friends with the wrong people. John 14. Turn to John 14. Listen to that conversation as it continues. Right after Jesus says, I will disclose myself, to the people who love me, listen to what happens in verse 22. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. But he who does not love me does not keep my words and the words which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. So when Judas asks, why are you only disclosing yourself to, uh, yourself to us and not to the rest of the world? Jesus' answer is basically because the rest of the world wants nothing to do with me. And that's the way it is in life too. Friends are supposed to strengthen our walk with the Lord, but sometimes we can't be friends with people because instead of strengthening and encouraging us, they're only dragging us down. And when that happens, 
we have to let them go or the friendship won't be a treasure at all. It'll just be a, a curse. What happened when the 5,000 walked away from Jesus? He let them go. What happened when the one out of the 12 turned his back on Jesus and betrayed him? Jesus let him go. That, I'm not saying he didn't care about him, didn't still love these people. But he realized friendship's not going to work out with people who want nothing to do with me, with, with people who love the world more than they love me. James 4 says we make ourselves enemies of God if we want to be friends with the world instead. And that's the same thing that happens today. If people continue today to reject Jesus and say, I don't want to be your friend, Jesus is going to let, let them go. And sometimes we can't be friends with certain people because they just don't care about us and our well-being. They say that they're friends, but they're really not interested in making us any better. And they're not interested in, in helping us or doing anything good for us. They don't care about God the way we do. Maybe they're headed in a totally different direction, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and it's and you know, we may want to keep them as friends, but it's only damaging us. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be deceived. Bad companions or bad company or evil companions, as some translations say, corrupt good morals. We may want to be friends with everyone. It sounds wonderful. But the truth is some friends are just toxic to our spiritual well-being. Sometimes we're trying to change and we're trying to move forward in our lives for the Lord. And we're repenting. We're breaking out of habits but all the friends that we have are like anchors chaining us to the past because they're still stuck in all the same habits and they have no interest in changing. Or it may be that those friends are only using us for what they can get out of the relationship, but they never contribute anything themselves to the relationship. We're always giving, 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 and they're just taking, 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 and, that, and that's it. One preacher said it like this, sometimes we find ourselves attached to people who need us, but never feed us. Sometimes we're attached to people who need us, but never feed us. That's why ultimately, folks, as we close, I want to say this, our best friends should be those in the Lord's church. It's certainly not wrong to have non-Christian friends, but if all of our closest friends are people who don't really care anything about the Lord and are on different trajectories in life, we need to take warning and ask ourselves, are these people really strengthening us on our way to heaven or are they weighing us down? When we can learn the difference between those people that we really need to latch on with and become good friends with, because they're just going to be a uh, good influence on, on us and we're going to be able to be a good influence on them. When we can learn the difference between those kinds of people that we need to latch on to and the kind of people that we need to let go. Well, that's going to help us excavate and uncover the lost treasure of friendship. And hopefully we'll find that our fellow Christians are the ones that we can call our dearest friends. And I love how John finishes his third letter. He's actually talking about Christians. And listen to what language he uses. He says in 3 John, verse 15, Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. He calls the brethren in the church the friends. They're not just friends. They're the friends. You know, I made a point earlier about maybe we don't have a common enemy because we're not in, in war anymore. That's a, that's a really good thing. I don't want to be at war at all. And maybe that's made it to where we're kind of fighting against each other. We don't have that same camaraderie. But folks, in the church, we absolutely are at war spiritually with a common enemy. And we'll need to band together and make friends with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ if we're going to take strength against Him. We'll need the 70. We'll need the three. We'll need the one. We'll need the lost treasure of friendship in our lives that Jesus had with His disciples, that Jonathan and David had, and that Tom and Jesse had. Are you here tonight? And you're not yet friends with the Lord. Jesus says... I'll call you my friends if you do what I command you. And he commands us to follow him, to believe in his name, to be baptized into him. And if you've already done that and you've wandered off and you've made friends with the world and are rejecting Christ, Jesus wants you back. He wants his friend back. If you're willing to come and be his friend again tonight, let us help you. Come forward while we stand and sing.